Michael Plant set sail from Maine to England. Uh, he would uh, be behind uh, his state-of-the-art sailboat uh, that he had, uh, you know, commanded many times. The first night, he called his wife and let him know where he was and how he was doing. Second night, he called and uh, his family again to let them know he was okay. Third night, there was no call. This was very much unlike him, so the family called the Coast Guard. And they dispatched word to all the ships in the area where he had last called from to see if anybody had seen him. Nobody had. Fourth day, they sent out helicopters to search all over the area and again contacted all the ships. Nobody saw him. Fifth day, one ship reported that they found him, uh, found his uh, boat turned over upside down and there was a hole in the ballast. Sailboats are the most stable of craft in the water. The ballast in the core is so heavy that they can go into the worst of storms, the highest of waves, the strongest of winds, and, and keep their stability. But if, there gets a, is there, if there's a hole in the ballast, it loses its stability. With a sailboat, it's what's beneath the water that determines the stability. It's the same with the Christian. It's what we do out of sight, not in the public eye, that determines the impact we make in this world. It's the beneath the surface practices we engage in, like reading the Bible and praying, uh, meditating on God's Word and, and thinking and reflecting, maybe memorizing verses that determine the impact we'll make in this world. Our practices beneath the surface determine our impact above the surface. We lead busy lives. Many of us work 50, 60 hour work weeks. Then we come home and maybe we have kids to, to take care of, homework to do with them, uh, maybe meals to prepare and clean up, houses to take care of, cars to maintain. Some of you parents are driving your kids from, to games and practices and performances and appointments. We have so many things going. When do we have time for beneath the surface practices like prayer and Bible reading and thinking? Statistics show the average pastor spends 10 minutes a day in prayer. Most of a pastor's time is public and visible. The average Korean pastor who spends one to three hours a day in prayer would be appalled. Jesus spent a lot of time in beneath the surface practices. Three years was given to public ministry. Thirty years were beneath the surface. In his public ministry, he taught people and healed people. But we also read that he spent a lot of time in prayer and fasting. There must have been reasons why he did that. I mean, you think, why would the Son of God need to pray and fast? He's the Son of God. But since he did, certainly we need to as well. This is the first in a short uh, three-week series called Praying Like Jesus. We want to learn about some of Jesus beneath the surface practices. Our text today, if you want to follow along, is Matthew 6. Uh, if you want to follow in the Bibles under the seats, uh, it's on page 970. Maybe you don't believe in Jesus. You're not even sure you believe there's a God. You wonder why Jesus made such a huge impact in this world. Let's look at two beneath the surface practices that help Jesus make an impact in this world that if we follow will help us make an impact as well. First, rediscover the abandoned practice of prayer. I say abandoned because my sense is we're praying less. We're leading busier and busier lives and 
feeling like, when do we have time to pray? How many of you prayed this week? Just raise your hand, nice and high. Looks like just about everybody. How many feel like you should have prayed more? Raise your hand. Most of you as well. Why do we pray so little? We claim we're too busy. But you know as well as I that we find time to do whatever we want to do. So that reason doesn't hold any water. The real reason we pray so little is because we do not understand its power. The Apostle Paul writes, For I know that through your prayers and God's provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. The Apostle Paul puts prayers on par with the work of the Holy Spirit in making an impact in this world. It is that important through prayer, we access the power of God. J.O. Fraser left England many years ago to minister to the Laizu people there in the mountain ranges of uh, western uh, China. The entrance to uh, where the people uh, are is, is at a village that's the midpoint. And when he got there, he, he said, God, wh where do you want me to go? Do you want me to go to the northern Laizus or the southern Laizus? He sensed that God's answer was, do both. And so he went to minister to the northern Laizu people, and his practice was to pray from sunup to noon for the southern Laizu people. And then from noon to sundown, he worked among the northern Laizu people. He worked there for 10 years. The work was slow, but a few hundred people came to Christ. After 10 years, he came out for a furlough, a time of rest and recuperation and to, to get new supplies. And he was in the, uh, the, the, the village and he, he now was well-versed in the Laizu language and he heard someone speaking in a different dialect. He realized this is the first southern Laizu he had ever heard. He got into conversation with this guy and he invited him to lunch and, and then he invited him to his uh, rented apartment and he shared uh, Jesus with him, and this guy was uh, very receptive, and he gave his life to Christ. So for two weeks, he discipled this man and told him everything about Jesus. He could think of everything about the Bible and praying that God would help him remember so he could share with the southern Lysus. Then he sent him on his way, and then he went back to work in the nor among the northern Lysus. A few years passed, and one day a delegation came from the southern Lysus, and they said, God is an amazing thing. Thousands of people have given their lives to Christ. We need somebody to come and teach us more. And Fraser, with tears forming in his eyes and with joy, realized that God had honored his time from sun up to noon, his time of prayer, and given him a harvest many times greater than his work among the northern Lysus. That's how powerful prayer is. And you can have the same impact. Jesus says that to be authentic in our prayers, we have to pass two tests. One is the audience test. The question we ask ourselves is, who am I doing this for? The hypocrites were praying to be seen by others. They wanted people to be impressed with them, how, how holy they were. Jesus says of them, and when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray, standing in the synagogues and on the street corners, to be seen by men. I tell you the truth, they have received their reward in full. We're authentic in our prayers when we pray to be heard by God alone and not to impress other people. Jesus says if you're praying for anyone else to hear, and that's why you do it, then being seen by others is all the reward you're going to get. You won't experience God's incredible supernatural power. Two is the secrecy test. The question we ask ourselves is, would I do this if no one else knew? Jesus says, when you pray, go into your room. Close the door and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Jesus says, when you pray, don't be like the hypocrites. 
Uh, the English word uh, hypocrite is a, a direct transliteration of the Hebrew word hupakritai. It's a term that came from the theater. Uh, an actor, actors put on a mask to be someone different from whom they really are. Everybody understood what Jesus was talking about with his word. Hypocrisy is trying to be something different on the outside than you really are. All of us go through this constant battle with the image. We want, to want, we want people to think something better of us than who we really are. Put on the best image for them. Jesus says if you want to be authentic, you want to be the same on the outside as you are on the inside. The same above the surface as you are beneath the surface. Well, we all try to put on a public appearance so we appear better than we really are. I saw a cartoon about a pastor and his wife and she said to him, I've got a good idea. How about this week you be grumpy at church and charming at home? <laughs> I, mean, I relate to that because Jory says that to me every once in a while. You know, how come at church you're so winsome and warm and outgoing and gushing with enthusiasm? Then you get home and you go silent and non-communicative and get grumpy. To make sure we're not praying to impress people, Jesus tells us to pray in secret. Get in a room alone, shut the door, pray to an audience of one, God. I'm afraid for many of us, this practice of prayer has been largely ignored. We live most of our lives in public with other people. Beneath the surface, Jesus says we should offer many prayers in secret. If we pray in secret, Jesus promises to reward us openly. In other words, the more we pray beneath the surface, we increase the impact of our lives above the surface. Fraser prayed for a half a day for years. The results were miraculous. The same thing can happen with you. Our practices beneath the surface determine our impact above the surface. Parents, you do a lot of things with your kids, for your kids. Maybe you're driving them from here to there and feel like it's just, you know, you can barely keep up. Many of you work full-time jobs and then you come home and there's, you know, kids and homework and meals and the house and... Maybe you're frustrated with how it's going. I challenge you, don't forget the most important thing. Maybe the most important thing you can do for your son or daughter is to pray. Don't forget to set aside time for that. Teenager, you've got school, you've got homework, you've got games and practices and performances and all the things you're doing, and you say, I, you know, I don't have any time. One of the most important things you can do is to pray. Pray for your day. Pray for your classmates. Young married. One of the most important things you can do for your marriage is to begin a practice of praying with your mate. Maybe you pray together in the morning. Maybe you pray at night. Or maybe you set one time uh, in the week aside to just give, you know, special time to prayer. Senior citizen. And maybe you feel like, you know, I'm getting tired and losing energy and I feel like, you know, I've done my, my service. Uh, it's, you know, I, it's time for me to pass the baton on to the younger people in the church. There's not much more I can do. The most important thing maybe you can do is to pray. You can have more impact doing that maybe than any other thing. There's a second beneath the surface practice we can engage in. Rediscover the abandoned practice of fasting. I'm talking about going without food for a period of time to devote yourself to increased prayer. Seeking God's will or enlisting his help and winning some battle with sin. Just a cursory reading of the Bible reveals that many of the most impassioned prayers in the Bible were accompanied by fasting. 
Moses fasted and prayed before the Lord for 40 days and 40 nights because of all the sins of the people of Israel. When Nehemiah heard that the walls of Jerusalem were torn down and the city lay in ruins, he mourned and fasted and prayed for days before Esther went to plead for her people before King Xerxes. She fasted for three days and three nights. When Daniel cried out for God to restore the people of Israel to Jerusalem, he pleaded with God in prayer and petition, in fasting, and in sackcloth and ashes. Another time, he fasted and prayed for three weeks. Luke tells us that Jesus did battle with the devil during a 40-day fast. And then he returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit. God responded to all these prayers that were accompanied by fasting. If fasting was an important practice for biblical characters and for Jesus, why do we hear so little about it today? Why do most Christians live as if teaching about fasting in the Bible has been torn out of their Bibles? I think it's because we assume that fasting is an Old Testament practice, is no longer relevant. Or we see the practice of fasting in many Eastern religions that believe that the body is bad and pleasure is to be avoided. And since we know the body is good and pleasure is a good gift from God, we think it's an outdated practice of the past. But Jesus says, when you fast, he assumes we will do it. We read, these are the Pharisees talking to Jesus. How is it that we and the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? Jesus answered, how can the guest of the bridegroom mourn while he is with them? The time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them, then they will fast. Jesus says, when I'm here, there's no point in my disciples fasting. But once I return to heaven, I ascend to heaven, then they will fast. I think we could experience far more power in our prayers if we return to the practice of fasting. I go without food one day a week to give myself to increased time for prayer. I set a prayer goal each, each, each day for uh, what I'm going to, you know, why I'm doing that. Maybe it's for one of my kids. I say, God, I'm worried about, maybe it's for my marriage. God, I need your help. Help me change to be a better husband. Maybe it's for friends of mine that don't know Christ. And I say, God, help me. Maybe it's something in the church. I said, God, I, I don't think I know how to do this. Maybe it's for some battle with sin I'm trying to win. I do it quietly. Nobody knows I'm fasting. What is it about fasting that increases our power in prayer? I'm, am I suggesting we earn God's favor by starving ourselves? Am I suggesting that we have to impress God and beg for Him? To give us something we need, we don't have to earn God's favor. That was already earned for us when Jesus died on the cross. We don't have to earn God's favor, but that doesn't mean there's no value in the practices of fasting. Fasting is a means of signaling to God and ourselves that we mean business when we pray. For most of us, giving up meals is a big deal. No sacrifice for God's kingdom goes unnoticed by the Father. When Jesus teaches us about fasting, he gives us some instructions so we don't go awry in our practice. He warns us to keep our fasting secret. He says, when you fast, do not look somber as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces to show men they are fasting. I tell you the truth, they have received their reward in full. He says, they have their reward they let people know they're fasting, so people say, my, how ugly he looks. Look how hard he's fasting. Look what a skeleton he is. Look how uh, much he's doing for God, how much he gives up. 
Jesus says, we're not to fast to impress people. He goes on, but when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face, so it will not be obvious to men that you are fasting, but only to your Father who is unseen. And your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. In the first century, uh, or in the Middle East, putting uh, oil on your face was essential. It was very dry and dusty, and skin would get dry. One of the things we discovered when we discovered the Dead Sea Scrolls, 1947, was uh, that uh, one of the Essenic cults uh, wrote that God loves rough faces. Apparently, they didn't put oil on their faces. Uh, they also didn't wash either. Apparently, they thought God loves smelly faces. They look somber and haggard so people would know they were fasting. Jesus says, don't do that. Wash your face, put oil on your head so no one knows. Our Lord is not interested in fasting to impress people. He's interested in beneath the surface practices done in secret. Jesus says, when we fast, do it in secret. So no one knows about it. It's a discipline we engage in between us and God. To get closer to God, maybe to give us more time to, to, to read the Bible and to pray. When we do, God, Jesus says, God will reward us openly. We'll discover special power. Our practices beneath the surface determine our impact above the surface. One of my professors in my Doctor of Ministry program uh, told about uh, uh, spending time with a rancher in North Dakota. And this rancher's son suddenly became uh, deathly ill, and so he, he took him into Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. They did all these tests, and they found he had a hole in his heart. So they rushed him into surgery, and uh, my professor sat with this rancher in the waiting room, and Surgery went on a long time. Finally, the doctor came out and he said, we did everything we could for your son, but I'm sorry, he died. And the rancher looked at that doctor and he says, no. I've been sitting here fasting and praying and I feel like God has told me my son's going to be fine. Now you get back in there and do whatever you have to do to revive my son. So the doctor went back in there and he came back out later and he says, you know what? You're right. Your son revived. Here was a man so in touch with the Spirit of God that he could tell a doctor, you get back in there and do your job. Do you want to be so in touch with God? then rediscover practices beneath the surface. Our practices beneath the surface determine our impact above the surface. We don't pray, we don't fast to impress God, to earn God's favor. Christ accomplished all that for us on the cross. But because we realize we are in a spiritual battle for our mates, for our children, for our parents, for our grandchildren, for our co-workers, our classmates, for our country. We give ourselves to these practices beneath the surface. You say, God, I want to make a difference in this world. And to do that, I need to pray. And fast more. Lord Jesus, thank you for coming to this earth and showing us practices beneath the surface. It's hard for us to even get why you, the Son of God, would even need to do these things. You're God. But because you did, you signal to us that we need to do so. Most of us confess that, you know what? We've been skimping on our prayers and thinking we just don't have time. Maybe not realizing we're giving up maybe the most important thing we could do. 
And for some of us, we've never thought about fasting. But Lord, we realize this is a life and death matter and we're, we got some serious spiritual battles going on. So help us with these practices. I want to give you a moment just to pray. I think it's important that you get a chance to pray after you've heard something from God's Word. Why don't you tell God what you heard today? And if, if you're convicted, do you want to do something? Tell Him. You pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for your example, showing us that some things are just vital. They're not seen by other people, but they matter. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.